Darren is a Philadelphia libertarian blogger and activist. His blog, The International Libertarian, is of course available on the web. Darren is the founder of Focus on Peace, a politically neutral peace movement. An interesting, unique idea. Focus on Peace is organizing the cross-philosophical, cross-political, anti-war peace fair. Darren is also involved with many other freedom projects, including Principled Non-Voting. Welcome to the stage of the Valley Forge Beef and Ale, Darren Wolf. Well, thank you, Ken. And I would like to thank all of my fellow liberty-minded peace activists, both here and online. Of course, I need to thank you thank Jim for being so tall. There we go. Uh, I'd also like to thank George Donnelly for organizing the Agora I.O. This is great. Today I'm going to talk about the peace movement. Some of the things that it is doing right, many of the things that it is doing wrong, offer solutions, but also touch on some of the reasons why the United States is at war, or at least the reasons that are given, and debunk them. Focus on Peace is an inclusive peace movement. It is one that people of all political persuasions can join in good conscience. The idea has been around for a while. Unfortunately, it has been all rhetoric until now. For example, the International Action Center, the IAC, had a conference last November. They named it the Regional Anti-War Conference and a National Meeting to Stop FBI Repression. They hailed it as a discussion of a new kind of unified and inclusive anti-war movement that can challenge the wars abroad and at home. As is usually the case with left-wing anti-war organizations, this one too comes with their social agenda as part of the package. On their website, they say that part of the discussion is to be about, and I'm quoting here, a massive movement to bring the war dollars, troops, and mercenaries home now rebuilding our cities, providing jobs, schools, and health care that we all have a right to." End quote. Bringing the troops and mercenaries home sounds great. It's the part about them using the money saved to finance government spending on social programs that is a problem for the liberty-minded. Given this reality, the question has to be asked, is this truly an inclusive anti-war movement? No doubt that by now, progressive listeners are rolling their eyes, wondering how this crazy libertarian could be against uh, spending money on health care and education. We're actually not. The problem is we oppose the government spending money on health care and education. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The point is, though, this isn't the time or the place to engage in a debate about these subjects. We can do that later, after we end the wars. Now is the time to agree, to disagree on some things, and to unite to stop the wars and oppression. Woo. Libertarians are reaching out to the left to stand together for peace. Sometimes with good results, and sometimes with uh, not so good results, let's say. Let me touch on the not-so-good results first. Personally, I approached the organizers of the October 16th peace rally in Philadelphia last year at their planning meeting a few days before the event. I spoke to them not about making any changes for October 16th, that event was just a few days away, but for future rallies. I asked them if they would be willing to put aside some of their agenda to accommodate people of other points of view. Now there, I was uh, politely but firmly told, does anybody want to guess what I was told? Sit down and shut up. <laughs> well, no, I was, it was polite. Uh, it was, the joke was that I was told to sit down and shut up. <laughs> no, they were very polite. They said no. <clears throat> Earlier this year, there was a meeting in Philly, leading up to the big peace rally of April 9th in New York City. There, Joe Lombardo of the United National Anti-War Committee got up and specifically said that the anti-war movement cannot be politically neutral. He said it must take up causes like social justice, the environment, and the Palestinians in order to be effective. It does make me wonder what his definition of effective is. It doesn't seem to be doing that much yet. 
Then there was the Declare Peace Fair that was put on by the Brandywine Peace Community over the 4th of July weekend over by Independence Hall. There, one of the socialists stood in front of the Focus on Peace table directly, and I thought rather rudely, contradicting our message. He was saying something to the effect of no need to be apolitical, stand up for the unions and health care and all the rest. I want to be clear, I'm not criticizing the Brandywine Peace community here. This is a, somebody who had a table at the fair. I actually rather like working with the Brandywine Peace community. They do keep their focus rather well. Lastly, there is a rather strange reference on the One People's Project website to uh, crackpot libertarians uh, latching on to the peace movement to advance their agenda. Hmm, it's a good thing the left doesn't do that. When the left tax on their social agenda to their anti-war coalitions that others cannot endorse, they tell us we're not welcome. We're not asking any of the organizations and individuals that are part of the IAC or similar organizations to change their advocacy. Their speakers can say all the same things they always have. Same with the signs they hold up. All we ask is that the anti-war coalitions themselves be politically neutral so we can all join them in good conscience. Well, enough of the bad news. Now for the good news. Fortunately, not everyone on the left is against unity. Many Greens, Naderites, and Progressive Democrats have said that they support the idea of a united peace movement. For example, uh, Veronica Nunn of Brooklyn for Peace wrote in an email, I looked at your website and I really like what the group is doing. There are quite a few people that are very turned off by the extreme left approach to peace. Joan Weil of Grandmothers Against the War wrote a reply to a comment that I made on a, an article she wrote. She stated her support for the Focus on Peace concept. I totally agree, Darren. I get so frustrated uh, when at a rally, for instance, speakers bring up unconnected, controversial issues that turn people off, who otherwise are dedicated to ending the wars. It's certainly a problem, and I'm appreciative that you brought it up. Also, Bob Small, a local Green Party leader, wrote on a mailing list. One of my leftist friends questioned how to bring in people from other political persuasions to the anti-war movement because they don't agree with us on other issues. My feeling is that that is why the anti-war movement has had 30 years of fragmentation, marginalization, and dissolution. The last march on Washington I attended featured 15 other issues, including a few I disagreed with. That was over five years ago. I decided they could stop the war without me. All of us who think that way need to come together. Now there are obstacles to our working together. It's inevitable when you put people of different ideologies in the same room. But these, ob these obstacles can and must be overcome. One of the major obstacles that I have seen is people on the left saying that we need to work on the big picture to achieve peace. And that includes things such as social justice and economic justice. I certainly agree that there is a big picture. It's just not the one that the left is talking about. Now, I'm going to go into a little bit of libertarianism here, not because I'm trying to push libertarianism on people who aren't libertarians. I just want to make sure that the non-libertarians who might be hearing me understand that we do have a big picture. It is intelligently considered, well thought out, and very fact-based. Uh, when the left decries the government's diversion of resources, from human needs to the military, it's on to something. War does impoverish us. But what the left needs to understand is that the government that has the resources to build schools has the resources to build drones. The government that has the resources to build roads has the resources to build jet fighters. And that government with the power to tax and create money has the resources to <clears throat> has the resources to buy weapons and wage war. Make no mistake about it, wage war they will. For it's very much like the progressive uh, commentator from the early 20th century, Randolph Bourne wrote, war is the health of the state. Giving the state resources only feeds the war machine. Welfare at home and warfare abroad are merely flip sides of the same coin. We cannot give the government the tools it needs to wage war and expect it not to do so. I'm not talking about weapons here. 
It's not enough that we advocate that they just not buy weapons. We have to take away the tools that they use to acquire them. That means we have to do a few things. One of them would be ending the Federal Reserve System, ending the income tax, ending the federal government's social spending, its regulatory role, and its police powers. Peace will only come when the government is powerless to commit evil acts both abroad and at home. That's a libertarian view. I'm not saying that everybody has to agree with us to stand with us against the wars. Far from it. We welcome people of other points of view. All we ask is the same consideration in return. Imagine the strength of a truly united and inclusive peace movement. We can do it. All it takes is a little tolerance and understanding. Speaking of tolerance and understanding, reminds me of the organization that I'm here representing, Focus on Peace. The few words. Our purpose is to have a peace movement that welcomes people of all ideologies, creeds, and beliefs. One that makes everyone feel not only comfortable, but a part of the movement. No one should feel that they are stand they're endorsing someone else's political agenda standing up for peace. To this end, we have one focus, ending the wars abroad. Now that the summer is over, we need to get back to work on this. We're going to be starting up our very popular sine waves again. But more important, as uh, Ken mentioned earlier, we're organizing what will hopefully be the first of the annual Philadelphia Peace Fairs. This will be modeled on the annual Brooklyn Peace Fair. There will be exhibitors, tables, workshops, and well-known speakers. The date is set for Saturday, uh, April 7th of next year at the Friends Meeting House at 4th and Arch Streets in Philadelphia. This is one you don't want to miss. It's going to be great. If you or your group would like to participate, you can uh, rent a table, place an ad in the program. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me about this. There is another group that uh, deserves mention here, and that is Come Home America, and their website is comehomeamerica.us. The basis of this group is a book, the book entitled Come Home America. This is a compilation of essays uh, written by participants in a conference that happened in February of last year. They describe themselves as unlike-minded people. What they unite them is their concern about the militarism that is taking over the country, and of course the wars abroad. People at this conference were left, right, center, libertarians, liberals, progressives, conservatives. What they were trying to do was reflect views, uh, the views of many Americans not represented in the uh, political dialogue in Congress, the White House, or the mainstream media. This group, too, deserves your support. At this point, let me uh, open up the floor to some questions if anybody has any. Or if anybody is putting up any questions above me where I can't see. Anybody? <clears throat> Oh, okay. Uh, when is the Philadelphia Peace Fair? And the question it was, when is the Phil when is the Philadelphia Peace Fair? It's Saturday, April seventh, in Philadelphia, of course. Any other questions? Okay, let me carry on. Let me touch now on some of the mainstream views or reasons, I should say, of why the U.S. needs to intervene overseas. The idea that the U.S. is fighting defensively overseas to keep the Muslim hordes from taking us over and implement Sharia law, this idea doesn't even pass the laugh test. The idea that we're promoting democracy is made an obvious lie by just looking at the dictatorships, past and present, that the United States supports and has supported. Let's put aside the, the media clowns. We'll put aside the, the babbling, scaremongering politicians. A more serious reason to intervene around the world is the protection of international trade. The argument is that since the United States is so dependent on global trade, we have to control the seas to ensure our continued prosperity. If we don't control the seas, another power that does might cut us off from our overseas markets and suppliers, badly hurting our economy. Certainly, there is some logic to this argument. Now, one advocate of this view is George Friedman. He is the founder and CEO of Stratfor, 
which stands for Strategic Forecasting. It's a private global intelligence company giving non-ideological analysis. Now, he wrote a great book earlier this year titled The Next Decade. It talks about geopolitical realities in the world and projects forward 10 years. Now, while I cannot agree with Mr. Friedman's pro-intervention conclusions, he does make very good points that few Americans are willing to face. Now, let me put it down. I don't, want to, but I don't want to promote his book too much. One of the major points that he makes is that the United States has become an unintended empire. This is important to bear in mind when talking about controlling the shipping lanes around the world. The great empires have always been about trade as much as they've been about military control, sometimes more so, and we're no different. Let me get back to debunking the pro-empire uh, pro trade argument here. Every benefit must be balanced against its cost, and the cost of maintaining an empire goes well beyond just the government's defense budget, State Department budget, foreign aid budget, UN budget, World Bank budget, International Monetary Fund budget, well, I could go on, but I'm sure you guys get the idea. We are talking about some huge costs here that are greatly slowing our economy, not stimulating it as some claim. Taking our cues from the wisdom of the French classical liberal economist, Frederick Bastiat, who in his essay, wrote, uh, who wrote an essay, which is that which is seen and that which is not seen, he tells us that we have to look deeper than just the obvious that is right in front of our noses. The benefits of empire would seem to be the trade and the relative prosperity we've enjoyed, at least until this recession started. Should I say end the Fed now? <laughs> the cost of empire is also in what is not produced because of the kind of government it imposes and the economic and social policies such a government implements. Earlier, I touched on how welfare and warfare go hand in hand. To get the populace to tolerate the cost of empire and support the government, these costs must be hidden and the people must be bought off by means of a welfare state. Let me add to that, the regulatory state, where the government pretends to be protecting people. What it's really doing is something else. Intervention abroad requires intervention domestically. In order to be strong enough to project power overseas, the government has to tighten its grip domestically, if only to acquire the resources it needs to do so. And this causes many harms in the process. I'm talking about how taxes, regulation, and welfare drain the economy and severely limit growth. Just one example, Social Security is conservatively estimated to cost us 5% GDP growth every year. Think about that. 5% compounded annually means you double your capital every 14 years. Now, Social Security's been around for a long time, but if we go back 28 years, by that math, we're living at about a quarter of the standard of living we should have. Taxes and regulations only add to the destruction of our wealth. When anyone says that losing our overseas markets would make us poorer, and that's why we need an empire, the answer is to say, well, the empire has already impoverished us. I think I would rather take a chance on freedom, peace, than free market. <clears throat> I haven't even touched on the destruction of our civil liberties under the kind of militarist democracy we have. We just heard about the Transportation Security Administration and how it's trampling our rights. Soon, we're going to hear talk about how the US has become a police state, and there will be another talk about opposing, opposing curfews. And when Larkin Rose gets up on this stage, hang on to your hat. <laughs> so I'm not going to belabor the point about civil liberties myself. It's been covered, it's been covered and it will be covered by others. Suffice it to say that uh, what seems obvious to us in the liberty movement isn't always obvious to the rest. One argument I hear a lot is that we are way free compared to the people that lived in uh, Nazi Germany. That's a dictatorship. That's not what we have here. We're free. Everything is okay here. Not perfect, but okay. Well, that's the argument. I disagree. We may not be suffering as much as the unfortunate people who lived under Hitler's government, but that does not mean we have the liberties we should have either. 
the process uh, is an old one. And unfortunately, while it should be obvious, it's not obvious to many people. What I'm talking about is that the illusion of liberty has to be maintained. Thomas Paine warned us about this back in 1795 in his uh, most famous book, The Rights of Man. Here are his words. The portion of liberty enjoyed in England is just enough to enslave a country more productively than by despotism. And that as the real object of all despotism is revenue, a, governor, a government so formed obtains more than it could do either by direct despotism or in a full state of freedom and is therefore on the ground of interest opposed to both. They account also for the readiness which always appears in such governments for engaging in wars by remarking on the different motives which produce them. In despotic governments, wars are the effect of pride, but in those governments in which they become the means of taxation, they acquire thereby a more permanent promptitude. So we have War for tax and tax for war. <clears throat> One reason I decided to stop picking on the left and focus on the mainstream is that we need to expand the peace movement. It, it remains a matter of the radical left on one side and the libertarians on another. It'll keep getting the same dismal result it has up until now. In between, is the two, in between the two sides is the great middle, the famous Joe and Jane six-pack. They're not radicals. They might be Democrats, they might be Republicans, they might be independents. They may also be anti-war, but where have they been able to turn? Well, until now, we've left them out of the peace movement. Now, though, with groups like Focus on Peace, they have a place to go to engage in peace activism. Any questions? I asked you if you had any questions. Okay, let me continue. I'd like to get back to uh, debunking some ideas about the United States and the Empire. And that means getting back to my favorite intellectual that I like to debunk, George Friedman. Also in the next decade, he states that he passionately wants the American Republic to survive the Empire it has acquired. Long live the unintended Empire. That means the Republic is dead though. He rightly points out that the Roman Republic was overwhelmed by its empire and doesn't want to see that happen here. Unfortunately, it has already happened. We're not about to uh, see a, an emperor crowned a la Julius Caesar. That's not going to happen in the United States in the 21st century. But the form of the Republic lives on long after the reality of it has died. Patrick Henry told us long ago that we can't be a republic and an empire at the same time. Back in 1788, arguing against adoption of the Constitution, he wrote a speech that he prophetically entitled, Shall Liberty or Empire Be Sought? This is what he said. But now, sir, the American spirit, assisted by the ropes and chains of consolidation, is about to convert this country into a powerful and mighty empire. Such a government is incompatible with the genius of republicanism. There will be no checks, no real balances in this government. What can avail your specious imaginary balances, your rope-dancing, chain-rattling, ridiculous ideal checks and contrivances? But, sir, we are not feared by foreigners. We do not make nations tremble. Would this constitute happiness or secure liberty? That's end quote. I would say the answer to his question is no. Today the world trembles before the American government's might. This includes many Americans themselves who are increasingly victimized by it. Patrick Henry's prophetic words come back to haunt us. I know where I stand when it comes to the question of shall liberty or empire be sought. I say liberty always and forever. Anyone else here feel that way? Yeah! yeah. Right. Whether you're on the left or the right, join us in standing for liberty by standing with us against the greatest destroyers that there are of it, war and empire. So you can check out our website very subtly displayed here, fopeace.com. 
you can see what we're doing there. Uh, those of you who are here can sign up for email updates too. How am I doing on time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, any questions? Yes. So uh, when the Arab Spring has reached uh, Syria and Yemen, there, you know, the, the, the armies are, have opened fire on their own people and slaughtering their own people. When the Arab Spring has reached um, Libya, then the Libyan army turned against its own people and NATO came in. And they, one of the things that happened was the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Libya was, was taken. Um, do you know who took that and what that whole thing is about? No, that's not the direction I expected your question to go in. Uh, the question was about a sovereign wealth fund in Libya and right. who took it and where it went. Uh, I'll, answer, I'll answer your question very honestly. No, I'm not aware of uh, who took it and where it went. Um, it seems like it's pretty normal when governments and the leaders of governments start running that they, um, well, I guess in days gone by it would have been suitcases full of money that they take with them. Maybe today they do electronic money transfers. But no. Uh, what I was going to say, though, if I can kind of answer not your question, but something related to that, um, why was there intervention in uh, Li Libya, maybe, and not Syria? I think the answer is obvious, that there's no principles involved in the intervention. It's all what the United States sees as uh, practical. Uh, they don't care about Syria. Perhaps they care about the oil in Libya. Therefore, Libya gets different treatment than Syria. Thank you. Thank you.